Hello everyone and welcome back to this new episode of the Few Shot Learning series. So in this episode we are, I'm going to give you a rapid overview of different methods that have been used in literature for tackling the Few Shot Learning problem. So I divide these methods in five main branches. So the first one is the transfer learning approach. It's a pretty simple approach that can be easily implemented and we will see later what does it mean. The second branch is based on a metric learning approach and historically these methods are the ones that have been created first and still today most of them are very competitive. Third approach is based on data augmentation and also this one is pretty easy to grasp. The idea is that you are going to increase the data in your support set since there are not so many data you can just simply take the data that you have you can increase it and now you have a proper data sets on top of which you can do your supervised learning a fourth approach are those probably more known at the moment the meta learning approach or learning to learn most notable is MAMA, Model Agnostic Meta Learning. I will dedicate one video to, to this approach because it's one of the few that is receiving a lot of attention. The fifth approach is the one based on Bayesian methods and it's probably the more theoretically grounded since it's based on probability theory, variational inference, but sometimes they are hard to implement. There may be some computational problems. I would see that if, if you follow a kind of variational, uh, from a variational perspective, they're quite still computationally cheap. Okay, start with the first approach, first branch, one of transfer learning. It's often considered like a baseline and I suggest you to give a look to this, to this article here. Because in this article, the authors show that very simple approach based on transfer learning, like the, the one that I'm going to show you now, they are still very, very effective and they can be better than many other fancy methods. And in transfer learning, there is a difference between the training stage and the test stage, where a training time as I told you in the first and second episodes, you have a, um, a data set of tasks where each task is composed of support, the query set. And the interesting thing is that at training time, you basically have labels for both support and query. It's a test time that you don't have anymore the labels for the query set. So the problem is only at test time, but at training time you actually have a proper data set because what you can do is you can stick together the different tasks and now you have a proper data set D and on top of this you can apply any kind of supervised learning technique now there is a, a fully labeled data set standard data set and you can use any supervised learning technique so how transfer learning works so at training time we are going to train a standard classifier so you just have your neural network convolutional neural network and you have your input is given by the images on your data set and you're gonna train a future structure here and on top of it you have a standard classifier that is in this case represented by a matrix wb and then you have your output that are your prediction okay on the query set or support set in this case it's just one data set so on your sample points then at test time, what happened? At test time, you don't have any more a proper data set. In this case, you have a support and a query set. But you can consider them as a set of labeled data in the support set and a set of unlabeled data that you want to predict in the query set. So what you can do is to train again your network, this time on a different set of images of inputs. But you can keep fixed the future structure. So the first stage of your neural network, is, is you, you don't touch these weights. 
I'm going to change just the set of weights in the classifier that from WB now becomes WN after a fine tuning on the support set of the uh, tasks at the set. So for each uh, task here, suppose you have uh, task one and uh, this is test time, right? So you have a task one, what you're gonna do is, is you're gonna use your support set. So use the support one to train again your network and then uh, you fine tune basically your W becomes W1 and then with W1 you're gonna do a forward pass and you're gonna predict the class in your query set for this specific task one and you repeat for task two you basically have follow the same approach and so on for all the tasks in your in your uh, uh, test set so each task in this case is a small data set and what you do basically is that if you have your input x for your query. We you do your forward pass or your set of weights, theta. Then you have your classifier on top, a set of weights here, w. And this w here, this has been fine tuned in a first stage when you were using the support set. So here with the support set, we're gonna keep this one fixed. We're gonna change just this one. So at this stage, we're gonna optimize W. W here is optimized, fine tune on the support set, right? And then you, you apply it to your query set. That's pretty much it. So this, this is the task for learning. It's very simple, very easy to implement. But nevertheless, this is very, very good, even in, in uh, tough data sets like ImageNet. All right, and we can see now the second branch. The second branch is the one of metric learning or learning to compare. What you wanna do here in this set of, of methods is to learn a distance metric, basically. One standard approach is the Siamese networks. Siamese networks, you have a neural network where the head, so the first part of this neural network, is like cloned. Okay, so you have this neural network with the same set of weights repeated two times, and each time you are taking as input a different input, x1 and x2, you are generating two embeddings here, and then you're gonna pass these uh, latent vectors inside another stage and you're gonna basically uh, check the similarity between these two vectors. You want to learn a distance matrix over there, you want a, dis a similarity measure, or distance me measure over here between x1 and x2. And as you may understand, this, this is, once you have the similarity measure, you can estimate the similarity between the support and the query set. And you can see to, uh, you can verify to which images in the query set is the most similar image in the support set and, and so therefore you can estimate the class, right? As you can see, the papers about Siamese networks are pretty old. This is a pretty um, classical approach nowadays. This, in 2015, this has been applied to the one-shot image recognition and today they are no more competitive. So there are other approaches that perform better than Siamese networks. So then a similar approach, uh, always in the learning to compare metric learning uh, branch, is the one of matching networks. Here the idea is that you want to match the target and the support. And you're gonna do this considering the support as a sort of sequence so that you can apply a better accurate and long short term memory on it. And um, it's a slightly more complex approach but the underlying idea is very similar to this one, so you want to learn to match support and query, you want to learn a sort of distance similarity uh, between the two, so that you can assign a query to a, a set of uh, images in the support set. So here we are still in the metric learning branch, so second branch, and I'm going to show you now what are the prototypical networks. It's a pretty neat approach, I like it. And we're going, I'm going to introduce you based on this image here. 
So in this image, we have a three way five shot setup. So if you don't remember what does it mean way and shot, I suggest you to give a look again to the first and second video. But basically three way means that we have just three classes. As you can see, we have class one, class two, and class three, three way. Five shot, it means that for each class, we have five points, as you can see, point one, point two, and so on, point three, point five, four, and five. For each class, we have five images in this case. But what we are going to do here, we are going to take our input, x, we're going to embed it in the first stage, neural network, a set of weights, inside of latent space z. And now, once we have this vector in the latent space, in this case is this one, so this is z, it's our latent space, okay? So we have a point in this latent space, in this case it's a bidimensional uh, space, and what we do is basically we are going to estimate for each image in the support set, we are going to estimate the latent vector, so this will be z1, z2, and so on. And then we are going to take an average of these arrays, and this will give us a prototype. This prototype for each class describe is a sort of mean of all the vector in, that we got in the support set to represent this specific class. So now let's suppose that we get a query point, so a query image, we are going to encode it inside a query latent vector. It's a bit misleading, this is not x, this is just z q now. So and this ZQ is just a point in this bidimensional latent space. And now we can, we can estimate the distance between this query point and all the class prototypes. In this case, we will have three distances. And the shortest distance identify to which class this query point belongs to. In this case, it's class 3. Here we can use a standard Euclidean distance to perform this comparison. Also, this, in this case, we have a very simple approach, but nevertheless very effective. And this has also been extended in different way. It is still uh, very competitive nowadays. Another approach is called uh, relation networks. Relation networks, basically, they're based on the idea that you have your support set, your query set, in this case, just one point. And what you do is to take the image, the images in your support set, are gonna embed it through a first stage of your neural network and then you're gonna get some future maps so you we are not more dealing with a, an array in the latin space but we are dealing with future maps it's just a stack of matrices here that are capturing some specific uh, properties of this input image and then what you do is you're gonna concatenate these future maps with the future maps of your query set. So you'll do the same thing here. You get another set of future maps represented by the yellow uh, the yellow shape here. You're going to concatenate it with the future maps of your support set. Okay. Once you did this for all the images in the support set, you will get a set of uh, a pile of uh, matrices that you're going to in a second stage, so here we have a second uh, set of weights to optimize. The second weights to optimize, they, they, they are going to basically check the similarity between the features of the super set and the features of, of the query set. And you will get a relation score. Basically, you are going to check how much the features in one part of this stack are similar to the other one. And this score is between 0 and 1 can be easily then, uh, uh, let's say, threshold to get a one hot vector representing to which class your query image belongs to. Okay. Nice approach, can get very good results with this one. We, we will see something later on a dedicated video. All right, we are now in the third branch 
this can be defined as a sort of learning to augment. You want to uh, basically learn a generator to generate new images from, from your support set. A more interesting approach is, is, is called Dagan. It's based on a conditional generative adversarial network. And you have a um, generator, a discriminator, and then you get your, your, your data from, from your support set. You're going to take a true image from your support set. You're going to generate some Gaussian noise. At this stage, you're going to concatenate the Gaussian noise with the uh, encoding of your image. So you will have a Latin representation with a um, concatenated uh, Gaussian noise and encoding of your image. And then you, you will have a generator that is going to generate an image here. And this image is then passed to a discriminator. This is a standard Gauss, uh, generative adversarial network setup where you have a generator and a discriminator. And you want the two distribution to get indistinguishable between each, each other. And the idea is that you can do this within class. So if you have, for instance, you are in a three-way setup, you have just three classes and one shot. So we have, for class one, we have just one image. We have class two, another image. Class three, another image. Now we apply Dagan. And what we get here is that we don't have any more just one image for each class, but we have a lot of them. And you can repeat this approach for the other classes that you have. So I think you understand the sense here. The sense is that from a small set of labeled data, now you have a huge set of labeled data. And once you did this, you're, you're done. You can apply a standard supervised method on top of this. And your future learning problem becomes now a standard supervised learning problem. OK, so this was based on genetic adversarial network. But in the end, we don't really care about realism and diversity of, 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 our, of our samples. So why we should use a genetic adversarial network here? What they do in this article is to say, OK, we can still use a first stage similar to this one. So this two stages are identical. You still have a generator, you have a noise Z here, you have a real sample here. We're going to produce an image with your generator, but now you don't care if this image is realistic. It can be something crazy. Okay. The only thing that you care about is that when you're going to use these generated samples together with your real training sample from the support set, you are going to join them inside your augmented training set. And then you are using your classifier. You just want that in your backward pass on the pipeline, you want that your generator produce something that is going to minimize your cross entropy loss, for instance. So you want that the generated samples here helps you to improve in your cross entropy. Uh, multi-class stage classifier here okay is the only thing you care about you don't care if these are realistic or not so a very neat and straightforward extension of Dagan is nevertheless very effective if you find a way to generate good images at this stage in both of these methods this can be still very competitive all right then we have a new branch here for one we are in the meta-learning setup. It is also known as learning to learn. So historically, the learning to learn approaches are quite old. From the 90s already, Smiduber and Benjo, they have been doing something about it. And uh, nowadays, uh, some approaches have been uh, reconsidering this idea. And in particular, MAML, model agnostic meta-learning, is the most known, I think. Why agnostic? Because this method is generic enough, it can be used for classification, regression, or reinforcement learning. And the idea is that you are going to learn a generic set of weights for your neural network. Once you have learned this generic set of weights, you want that uh, to move rapidly towards new tasks. So if I get 
task 3, task 2, task 1. I want to rapidly move with a few steps uh, my set of weights uh, W, uh, sorry, my set of weights theta towards theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, so that my network is now very good at task 3, task 2, and task 1. Okay, that's the idea. So this paper received a lot of attention. There has been more than 1,000 citations, I think, at this, at this point. There has been many extensions. For instance, one of those is called MAMAL++, and the authors here have improved many aspects of MAMAL, especially the generalization performance, convergence speed, and computational overhead. And this is a very neat improvement over MAMAL. There is then another approach called MetaSGD. We use the same idea here of MAMAL. But the idea is that now I have a meta learner, and this meta learner is going to determine the ingredients of an optimizer, or, or a stochastic, stochastic gradient descent optimizer, such as the initialization, update direction, and learning rate. So if I get these ingredients, it means that I, I don't need anymore to do small step, right? Like in MAMA. In MAMA here, we are going to do small steps, a few of them, until we reach this particular set of weights, okay? So every time we have to do a certain amount of steps to each set of weights. Here, no. Here we are going to do just one step and we are going to reach the end uh, configuration of our, of our weights because we can also uh, change the learning rate. It means that we can do uh, larger jumps in the weight space. We can directly reach our configuration. We'll see something about this later in the series, okay? There, is, there will be a dedicated video about MAMAL, about this variation, so this will be um, an interesting video. All right, then we have the fifth branch. Fifth branch deals with Bayesian methods. So most of these methods, if we're going to give a look to the first one, for instance, Bayesian MAMAL, um, most of them are using some kind of uh, variational inference tricks to improve the, uh, the basically the meta learning stage in some cases and to basically solve the future learning problem using a probability perspective. This is a very neat interpretation of the future learning problem and uh, that in the end can be considered a, sol a, a sort of multi stage uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian setup. And some of the methods I've been dealing with Gaussian processes, one of those is the adapt adaptive deep kernel learning. In deep kernel learning, you're basically training a, a neural network to be the kernel of a Gaussian process. In the adaptive deep kernel learning, you, you are not going to use just a fixed set of weights, uh, sorry, a fixed kernel for your neural network, for your deep kernel but you are going to adapt this kernel to a specific task. So every time that you get a new task, you can adapt um, the kernel and you can choose the kernel that is more appropriate to, the, to that specific task. And this is a pretty nice approach and can lead to pretty good results, okay? An extension I've been working on of Gaussian process for future learning is this one. It's based on the idea of having a set of hyperparameters for the kernel and a set of weights for the neural network can be uh, both of them optimized on all the tasks at training time. And then once I, I, uh, I've been training these two set of weights at test time, can use it again uh, on, the, on the support set to have some prediction on the query set. Okay. It's a pretty straightforward implementation of Gaussian process on the future learning problem. It's a pretty uh, nice theoretical background from all the Bayesian literature that I can explain what's going on in this specific setting. All right, folks. So I think that that's it. I hope that I give you a pretty good overview of what's going on in the recent literature in future learning. In the next videos, we are going to uh, uh, study some of these methods. We are going to see how we can uh, implement them in PyTorch. And so for the, for the moment, thank you for watching and see you next time.